It's Clipper Blog Live. Andrew Hahn here. The Clippers fall to the New York Knicks, 99-93. Bring in our national panel from Brooklyn, Charlie Widows. From Alabama, Nick Flint. Oceanside's DJ Foster. Steve Novak, man. <laughs> and our guest tonight, Kevin Arnovitz. Kevin, let's start with you. Uh, what did you think about this game? I, mean, I think the story is not what we saw, but what we didn't see, which was Chris Paul. And it's, uh, as we were talking about pre-show, it, it's a big concern in the sense that this was an important game. Uh, if Chris was held out, it was for good reason, certainly. And if that reason is is that he's debilitated, um, groin injuries are not something you just sort of shake off in a couple of days. I mean, this the prospect of not having a Chris Paul who's 100% in the, in the postseason is the specter of that is really dangerous for the Clippers. And, um, you know, I, I have no reason to think that the uh, staff didn't make the right choice tonight. Um, but it, it, I mean, it, this was a meaningful game and it, it wasn't as if, Oh, they were resting him. They have the seating locked up and you can hold him back. It, this was for home court. Uh, they instantly became, they were a two point underdog this morning. Uh, so by virtue of not having Chris out there, I, I mean, this, this is a cause for concern going in. Kevin, I thought towards the end of the game, was the, tonight's fourth quarter was one of the more wacky uh, games you'll ever see because Clippers started to come back to it. Um, the Knicks left Mello on the bench. Did New York really want to win this game, and does it make it even worse that you know, they're trotting out Gadzorik and Bibby in, in crunch time. The Clippers couldn't come all the way back. I mean, there, there's the Clippers come back was spirited, yeah, without Anthony on there. And, and Chandler, for the better part of the fourth quarter, yeah. who I think is really their kind of primary difference maker and one of the reasons the Clippers couldn't buy a bucket uh, for the better part of three quarters. But, um, yeah, I, I mean, it's disappointing. There were some signs of encouragement. Uh, one is is that I, I, I love seeing Blake work out of sort of the mid post as as a distributor, as a facilitator. Uh, we talk about his ball skills. We talk about the Clippers' need to not shoot contested jumpers, but rather work inside out. That's kind of cool. Uh, Randy Foy, you know, I didn't have him in the round table as who I wanted on the court in the last two minutes of a game a couple days ago, and, you know, I'm already kind of second-guessing myself. You know, they had uh, – Vinny went to him rather than Mo, and it, it was probably a good choice. Uh, Chris Paul is fond of saying that Randy Foy doesn't know how good he is, um, which might speak to confidence more than anything else. And, and it's good to see that he's a guy who can be a perimeter scorer absent Chris Paul. Now, I don't think that gets them through Memphis, but you know, if you're looking for silver linings, uh, you know, Foy's continued momentum. Did you know? I mean, this was a stat that ESPN shared with us on air. He leads the league in three pointers made since the All Star break. Four. Yeah. Wow. That's incredible. Yeah. yeah. It's absolutely incredible. 47% so, um, in the month I mean, of April. It, look, what's dispiriting is the Clippers are going to probably be in Memphis on, on Saturday morning. And they are not a favorite in any series where they start on the road. Kevin, do you think over the last, uh, I don't know, a week or so, like, do you think they thought this was a possibility that they wouldn't even have home court? I mean, none of the games they've lost – have been, I mean, at Atlanta, Atlanta's a good home team, right. playing for something, essentially playing for the same thing the Clippers are playing for, which is a home and a 4-5. or five. Um, You know, the Knicks are a decent team. And, you know, the Phoenix loss, I mean, they had that nice win in Denver. Um, they came back to Staples, one on Sunday. I mean... The New Orleans game? You know, I, I think the notion was is they, they were the team that was playing better than Memphis. I mean, Memphis was sort of the ugly duckling playoff team last week of, uh, you know, we all caught Grizz fever and then, you, you know, they went away. But, uh, you know, I, I don't know that the Clippers, you know, considered it. I mean, it seemed like surpassing the Lakers for the three was a more distinct possibility than falling to the five, at least one week ago. Uh, I have a question here, and I'm going to start with Nick about this. Do you, do you think 
that this could be a I wouldn't say it's a win-win situation, but the but the best case scenario, given the fact that Chris Paul did pull his groin last night, I mean, if if it's not serious, then you just bought Chris Paul an extra day to make sure he's fully recovered. And the Clippers showed kind of a spirited energy at the end, kind of closing that double-digit gap, and it gave some of the role players some more confidence, maybe that they could kind of do things, and it wasn't entirely based on Chris Paul. Uh, Nick, you want to uh, tackle that one first? Uh, well, I would have preferred no injury to Chris Paul for sure, and then maybe just uh, you know either you know decide you want to rest him because whatever you want a little bit of time before the playoffs or you know have that option rather than uh, well Chris Paul's injured now it's you know kind of like a hamstring a uh, a groin injury can linger that's not good news um, in terms of the uh, the role players I I don't know if they you know you can read that much into a single game if you can read that much into how much they're going from a thing but uh, I enjoy Randy Foy I enjoyed a little bit more uh, more burn for blood so he got some fourth quarter minutes in there uh, push the ball that was fun to, fun to see but yeah I wouldn't uh, I don't really read too many positives into this game or too many positives too much of anything into the game outside of oh, now Chris Paul has a uh, a little injury to deal with. Yeah, I didn't I don't know what to read. I like you try to read it as a basketball game, but then on the other hand there was this subtext that was going on, you know, on the on the PA announcer during the middle of the third quarter, they actually announced that Orlando had won their game. Uh, it was like everyone was kind of half in on this storyline that was going that was going on, and then you know Mello wasn't playing down the stretch, even as it was getting closer. I, like, I, I couldn't tell if like half the Knicks w were trying to win and half weren't, or it, <laughs> it was just a weird game. I didn't really understand what was going. You know, so like I try to, you know, I noticed, you know, as the Clippers, uh, from the Clippers' perspective, like you could tell what was going on without Paul, but it just wasn't. I wasn't sure uh, what anyone was trying to do out there. <laughs> Yeah, I thought the trying to win. <laughs> I thought the funniest part was when uh, the cameras panned to J.R. Smith going back to the Knicks huddle, and uh, like Mello and the starters were just like very reluctant high fives, like no no smiles, like no big celebrations, just like we don't really know what we want to do here. It was a weird game, very weird game. Well, I think the other thing is that I, it's entirely possible maybe the Knicks don't consider my uh, Chicago a better matchup than Miami. I, I mean, it maybe I, I don't think they're probably that much different anyway. I mean, I think, look, I, I think there's a sense that whether or not they wanted to play Chicago or wanted to play Miami, and, and most coaches, it sounds like a cliche, but I think it's actually true, which is you want to just be playing good basketball. Right. Uh, you know, you want, they have a lot of rhythm players on New York, whether it's J.R. Smith, whether it's Steve Novak, uh, you know, to a lesser extent, you know, Barron, I mean, Iman Schumper's still a rookie. You know, you want to be playing well. And if playing well means you know, not tanking, at least nominally, I mean, it's important. So, I mean, they weren't going to come out and just, I, I think you, you can hold a guy back like Carmelo, but once you're on the floor, you're on the floor. I mean, I think we've, we've talked so much about tanking through hoop idea and everything else. I mean, the issue is not guys going out there and dogging it. I haven't seen anyone. I haven't seen the guys who were playing for Golden State, who were playing for New Orleans, who were playing for all those teams that are tanking, I mean, Charlotte even. I mean, they're playing. I mean, the issue is, is the personnel that's on the floor isn't competitive. Well, I think that's the question. The Clippers were playing a team that wasn't didn't have their best personnel out there, even if they were playing hard. Uh, yeah, they, they, had, they had Carmel in the first half, who absolutely obliterated them. And at that point, yeah, right. really the tough uh, right. is a is a tough deficit. Um, but again, I, I think I, I'm sort of with Nick on this. I, I didn't glean a lot from a basketball standpoint, other than yeah, it's nice to see this, nice to see that, disappointing to see this. The rotations kind of stunk. Uh, the one thing that I think is dispiriting is the defense because, I mean, Chris is a good defender. Eric's a better defender. And, you know, you, 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 the game to some extent in the first half was lost uh, on just the, the incoherence of the rotations and um, just missed assignments and, and lousy closeouts. And from that standpoint, it's disappointing because Chris's absence and minutes given to Eric Bledsoe, if anything, statistically – should support a better defensive effort, not a lesser one. Kevin, you uh, you're, you just touched on it with your comment there. We have a various assortment of tweet questions, basically talking about Chris Paul and Chauncey and 
earlier in the season, Chauncey Bill up masking uh, Vinny Del Negro's coaching mistakes. Do you think uh, that's pretty much what's going to doom this team? It seemed kind of weird that Chris Paul and Eric Bledsoe when in the game, they really closed that gap, and it looked like the, the Clippers could actually pull this one out without Chris Paul. Um, and then they inexplicably, inexplicably pulled Eric Bledsoe for a large portion of that second half uh, and went with uh, Mo Williams' Nick Young defensive backcourt that was largely ineffective. I, I know Charlie was frustrated by that. I mean, I'm not going to kill Vinny for that. Uh, um, look, Eric started. Eric was ineffective as a starter. Mo Williams came in and basically kept the Clippers close. I mean, my, my loyalties in the backcourt have, have been previously stated. I, I think Eric's a tremendous defensive player. But uh, I didn't have any explicit problems with the rotations. The only one I would suggest is once the Knicks went with Novak at the four. I mean, I like Kenyon, and we all love that Kenyon can guard seven positions and all that's great. <laughs> but, but why not, you know, look, I mean... I, you can stick Karan on, on Novak. You can bring Mo back in the game. You can go with Eric, Mo, Randy, and Karan, you know, with, with Blake as your five. Uh, I mean, Tyson was dealing with him anyway. So that would be my only thing is, 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 you know, Kenyon doesn't really help you offensively. If his concern is, well, we're going to get beat up on the boards, that's reasonable. But that would be my only rotational objection tonight. Uh, but listen, I love Eric. He was completely ineffective completely ineffective offensively in the first half. And Mo essentially kept the Clippers in it, you know, for the second quarter. I am no fan of Mo's defense. But uh, – and Mo didn't play down the stretch, you know. So so, so there we go. They also had Shumpert on uh, on Bledsoe, which was a tough matchup for him. Yeah, but that's – that's that's the, that's welcome to the professional basketball. Right. right. <laughs> uh, guess what? Tony Allen's, you know, up next. And, Mike. by the way, Mike Conley. Mike Conley. Uh, right. Conley's one of the five best defensive point guards in the league right now. If you ask Collins, he says he's one of the top three. Mm. Um, so, you know, I mean, we're, we're about to see just a really just vicious, nasty defensive squad for the next two weeks. So uh, all hands on deck. Uh, Twitter question here, DJ, if you could feel this one. Info asks, so should we officially buy into Randy Foy being an actual player? <laughs> I mean, I think you should definitely buy into Randy Foy as being a good spot-up shooter. I don't, I don't want him in positions with the ball in his hands. Even though he did a pretty decent job tonight, early on, um, you know, creating shots for himself. But I think as a spot-up shooter, he definitely has a, you know, a role in this league going forward. He kind of transformed his game um, through a lot of working out, a lot of you know, shooting shots over the summer with. You know, as Blake Griffin and Randy Foy were the two guys who were at the facility every day this summer before the lockout. So, I mean, I, th I think he's definitely established himself as a pure spot-up shooter, and he's cut out a lot of those stupid long twos and, you know, foot-on-the-line twos that killed him, you know, any efficiency he had previously. So, yeah, that's, I, I think he can be a legitimate bench player on a championship team to come in and, and be a good shooter, definitely. Okay, let's uh, let's expound upon that a little bit more. Nick, obviously the Clippers are only going to go as far as Chris Paul and Blake Griffin carry them. Is it fair to say that Randy Foy is the option that has to put them over the top in a, in a series where it's so close you can't really determine what it's going to be? It's, it's going to be Randy Foy's shooting that can give them a series victory? Who's this one to? This is to you, Nick. <laughs> oh, great. I missed the first part of that, so it was perfect timing. Uh, I, I don't want to let a specific player that's who I put so time. The way oh, now Nick I got robot plays defense, voice. especially if we're looking oh, at that. Man. Ah, wonderful. Can you still understand me? Well, we can now. That was All terrible. Right. <laughs> uh, moving along. Uh, the way Memphis plays defense, you know, it's... Uh, I definitely don't see Chris Paul, you know, being a scorer in that kind of situation. I think that, you know, you're going to see a lot of aggression on the ball. You're going to see uh, uh, quick swing passes should be able to do some damage. So, you know, uh, I think Karan, Randy, uh, Mo, when he comes in, he hasn't been as effective down the stretch this season, you might say. So uh, I think everybody's going to have to step up more or less, which... Which probably means that Nick just cut out. <laughs> 
Um, pop out, but there you go. Is there is there anything else that we want to talk about this game? I mean, it's the end of the regular season for the Clippers now. Looking back, is this kind of where you hoped the Clippers would be at the start of the season? Charlie, you want to uh, start us off here? I, I don't want to say hope. Um, I, I think it's pretty damn close to what I thought they'd be uh, at the beginning of the season. Um, exactly what it was. Just one, one last thing about this game. I, I do think it's pretty encouraging to see Blake Griffin have maybe his two best offensive games against Josh Smith and then Tyson Chandler. Absolutely. Uh, and tonight without Paul taking attention and making things easier. So that, that was pretty encouraging. Yeah, I, I agree with that completely as far as Blake goes. Uh, the way, you know, no Chris Paul, the whole defense collapsed on him. He's still going straight up into probably the defensive player of the year who's just a killer in one-on-one, -on -one, you know, situations on the block. So that's that's very encouraging. Um, but, Andrew, what was your original question? Because I got caught up in the, in the Blake thing. <laughs> Do you, uh, is, is this kind of where you expected this team oh. to be? You know, I, I predicted right around the 4 or 5. I thought it was actually going to be Lakers, Clippers, 4 or 5, um, with the Clippers at 4 and the Lakers at 5. Um, so I was a little bit off, but uh, I think right in this area is where most of us expected them to be, yeah. Kevin, how about you? I'm trying to remember where I had them at the beginning of the season. I had Lakers, Clippers sort of neck and neck uh, for the Pacific Division crown. Uh, I think I had them as a three or a four. So you know, not hosting, I think, is a real disappointment. I think if we have to pull back, I mean, that that's the disappointment of the last week or so. Uh, Clippers made a really fierce run uh, over a, a two- or three-week period following the debacle in New Orleans on, I think it was the 26th of March. And, mm -hmm. you know, they came all the way back, and, and now it looks like they'll start the first week of the postseason on the road as underdogs, uh, which means, I mean, frankly, they're a less than 50% chance to come out of the first round. And I think, you know, we've talked all season about how no one really – has a firm grasp on what the expectations of the Los Angeles Clippers are. We, no one has ever said, well, it'll be a disappointment if X. I mean, we knew if they didn't make the playoffs, it would be a disappointment. We knew if they made a conference finals, it would be wildly um, celebratory. We didn't know in that sort of somewhere in between what would be deemed a disappointment. Well, if they went out ceremoniously to a really good Oklahoma City team, well, that would be okay. Um, so what's coming happening right now is, is expectations are coming into focus. And, you know, this this is a five seed and they're going to again that we still have to see about tomorrow night's Memphis game, um, which is a probable W for them. But, you know, now the expectation is such that, I mean, teams that start on the road are expected to lose. Um, on the other hand, the upside is if they win this series against Memphis as a five, it becomes a more meaningful achievement than had they wanted merely justified of their seed as a four. So, you know, if, if, if you're trying to draw the narrative, it, it, had, it, it changed tonight. I mean, the narrative changed tonight. The Clippers will now be an underdog in a series, and if they win that series, they will more than justify their seed. They will exceed it, rather than just merely defending the four. You know, Kevin, for the, for the past week or so, I've been trying to uh, sell this story that this year's Clipper team is – more akin to last year's Memphis team, and, and this year's Memphis team is like last year's Portland team, that Cheek picked to kind of make that run to the conference finals. And this year's Portland team is somewhat like last year's Clippers team, so trying <laughs> you're all set, man. You, you, you have come. That's beautiful. All right. Uh, Charlie and DJ kind of touched <laughs> That wasn't early. meant to stunt your theory. <laughs> you got me on, like, pins and needles now, man. Like, you have this unified, holistic theory, and I want to hear the end of it. There, there, there is no end to it. The, the, the only thing is that, the, you know, it just really seems like a lot of people are banking on Memphis because of what they did last year, and they haven't really been paying attention to how good Memphis has been this year, and they haven't been quite as stout as they were last year. I mean, Nick sees a lot of their games, and he seems to agree with me. DJ still lives in fear after that first round <laughs> upset. It's Nick not even so much the upset. I just I think Memphis is one of the worst matchups when you're you know talking about Denver and Dallas were the other options. I'd I'd much rather play Denver or Dallas than Memphis. 
Yeah, I, I'm scared. I, I would too. I'm scared for my life. Okay, Andrew, <laughs> just call me out on it. Nick, our, our regional well. blogger. They they plan well in Memphis. I mean, they just uh, I, they're they're going to be a really tough matchup for the Clippers, as as Denver and, and Dallas would. I mean, Denver kind of scared the bejesus out of me because I just that that tempo just makes it should make Clipper fans nervous. But obviously, that's neither here nor there. They're playing Memphis, and, and we know that. Yeah, I mean, I keep on going back and forth with it, especially the playoffs this season. It's a lot different from, uh, you know, strong Spurs team being taken down uh, by the matchups with Memphis. So, obviously, they know how to game plan. Uh, they make adjustments. Uh, Lionel Hans is not afraid to, uh, I guess, experiment with lineups in some cases. You know, we haven't seen the kind of the kind of lineups they're going to throw out in the playoffs. Ugh. Hey. Nick's terrible internet. It's just so <laughs> awful. It makes I think we're gonna, people's internet. They have a, a very weak. I am not. I can. The is I can hear it perfectly clearly, and yet you can. I hate. Them. Yes, that that's how insanity usually starts. It's perfect in your head. <laughs> uh, we're we're just gonna bookend the regular season here, and uh, go over some of these end of year awards. See if. The Clippers had any Clipper members had any real shot at, at them, and I just want to hear what your thoughts are overall about who would, who's going to win these. Charlie, let's start with you. Uh, did Mo Williams ever really have a shot at the Sixth Man Award, or was that just luck from the early season? Well, I think we like to make a conversation when sometimes there isn't a conversation necessary. So, uh, you know, we have an MVP conversation, and LeBron James is probably the MVP, but. There was a time, yeah, when, when he was, the, I thought, the second best sixth man and James Harden was the best. And if we wanted to talk about another contender, then he would have been the one. Uh, I don't think that lasted very long, though. So. Okay. So then you, you definitely think it's Harden. It's just no-brainer. I, I think it's Harden, yeah, and it's definitely not Mo Williams anymore. Do, does anyone have an opinion on who should be second if, if it's not going to be Harden? DJ? Oh, I think I agree with Charlie. It absolutely has to be Harden for six man. Um, probably Lou Williams, I guess, is the safe. The safe. A Williams. Bet. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, defensive player of the year. That's DeAndre had no chance at, at this, right? It, it's probably going to be Chandler or maybe Howard. Kevin. I like Garnett this year. Um, you, you know, you look at the defensive rankings by team. And, I, you know, I watched a lot of uh, – I, I was sold when I, I wrote a piece uh, a couple of weeks ago about a lineup that Boston fields now with uh, Bradley at the two and Garnett at the five. And, you know, so I watched a couple hundred possessions. Uh, pretty much every possession or, or, or so that team had been out there. And, and what's amazing about Garnett is you, there's not one mistake. Not one mistake. And it's all subtle and it's all nuanced. And there are no block shots – and, you know, there's no bravado. It's just the guy moves on a string. He just, it, it, it's, I mean, I think I wrote that he could defend a pick and roll blindfolded. And, and I firmly believe that. And it, look, Chandler's a phenomenal defensive player. If he wins, I'm happy. Um, uh, there's some wings out there. LeBron James, Andre Godala, you know, Tony Allen, I think has a pretty good case. But uh, Garnett, to me, has perfected the art of, the big man pick and roll defense, and I'm one of these people who believes that just it sounds weird, but your four and your five's ability to defend a pick and roll, I think, is 30% of your way to a title. I mean, I, I just I, I believe that. And when you look at who the final four teams last year were, pretty much makes sense. Mm -hmm. Nick, are you on board with a uh, Kevin for Garnett? Oh. Well, I can't say more than 10 words, so yes. Sounds good. Okay. So we're so Garnett then. I, okay. Uh, I'll go check. This isn't one I, of those. I would say. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, 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 I guess Defensive Player of the Year would be one of the few awards that has the most number of uh, eligible candidates. It's not like some of these other things. I mean, I don't think this is a contentious debate. I mean, you tell me if any number of any one of 9, 10, 11 guys won it, I'd be right. fine with it. Yeah. yeah. Right, it, Garnett would absolutely deserve it if he got it. Um, I think Chandler, for me, is would be my pick just for, I mean, you look at the difference that he made in New York. They were, what, 
20th, something like that, in defensive efficiency, and all of a sudden they, you know, launched into top five overall, and that's a lot of that has to do with them. They don't have a lot of plus defenders on that team, although Schumper probably deserves some credit too. But, yeah, Gar- if Garnett won it, you guys know I, I lo- love me some KG, so uh, I'd-, I'd be cool with that. Okay. Uh, rookie of the year, Trey Tompkins didn't. I mean, he didn't play even <laughs> enough minutes to be eligible. What? It's It's going to be Irving, right? Nick, it's going to be Kyrie Irving. Nick, it's just yeah, you, yeah, uh, by far, it kind of ignored in Cleveland, but sure. Yeah, okay. I, I not that any of us have have uh, votes here, but I would throw some love for Isaiah Thomas, the 60th pick, playing some solid basketball. Uh, most improved is the, is there could could Randy Foy have done that? Win, win this award if he'd started a little bit earlier. I mean, he, he's been playing pretty good. Charlie, what do you think? Yeah, I hadn't thought about that. We actually voted today. I, I voted today for the True Hoop Awards. I didn't think about Randy Foy. He's made a late run, though, definitely. And if he, yeah, absolutely, if he started earlier, he would have been in there. I think there were some good players. I, I, it was an interesting list um, of guys that I hadn't. I, I think um, Pekovic is going to get a lot of yeah. a lot of love, which I think is, is cool. Um, Ilya Sova. Ilya Sova, right. I wonder, like, it's so this, this this that award is so subjective. I mean, like, what about Kevin Love? I mean, he was really good last year, but he's an MVP candidate this year, I think. Um, I don't know. There's some, there's a lot. Harden, all these kinds of guys that that took a jump. I, it depends on where you started and where you want to see who finished. I, I, it's pretty clear cut for me, um, and I, I, I think it's definitely difficult to judge. It just depends on. And to call it the guy making the leap from great to superstar, like Harden or whatever it is. But uh, for me, it's Ilyasova in Milwaukee. I feel like he was kind of, you know, no one was really saying anything about him. He's been in the league, what, two, three years now. And uh, he just blew up after Bogut got hurt. He's the second best, we saw tonight, second best three-point shooter uh, percentage-wise in the league. Um, he's a, he gets like 11 rebounds per game now. He's he's a Kevin Love without uh well he's not Kevin Love but he, he's he's a poor man's Kevin Love. He's putting up similar stats, uh, getting very little recognition for it. So I would he would be my choice. All right, Kevin, it'd, it'd be mildly upsetting if it was Jeremy Lin, right? Great story, but I mean, for, from someone that just didn't play at all to playing pretty well, you can't really vote him most improved, could you? I'm sort of a minutes played guy, and it's nothing against the story, which I love. Um, my my selection was Demarcus Cousins. Cousins, right? And, and I, you know, and and I, by the way, I love Ilya Sova for this award too. And another one where any number of four or five guys, as DJ said, are we talking about the jump from? you know, pretty good to awesome, from just horrible to respectable. You know, how you define that margin is very difficult. For me, Cousins, though, I, I mean, he's a brute. He's a guy you go to at the end of games now. And, I mean, he had a player efficiency rating below 15, which is, you know, kind of below league average, um, you know, on Hollinger scale. And now I, I don't know what it is, but I suspect it's above 20. Um, but this is a guy who is, I think, refined every one of his skills and probably still, I mean, what's crazy about Cousins is, I mean, I fear that the guy might be a candidate next year, too. I mean, he might make yet another jump. Um, yeah. But I'm seeing a guy who I think could potentially be one of the 10, 15 best players in the league um, in two years. And, I think so. I think so, too. And he, you know, they, 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 they were a bad team this year, um, but they played better. And I, 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 I watch a lot of them because I actually their, their, their broadcasting crew is it's funny how league pass works. You tend to gravitate toward teams <laughs> whose crews you can, you know, tolerate or appreciate. And uh, you know, Sacramento when the Clippers aren't on on, on a Pacific time zone, uh, some a place I actually go. And and, and Cousins is just really skilled, and yeah. the, those skills really kind of were, were, were well apportioned and, and and well honed this year. And that's why he's my choice. Just yeah. looking up Cousins uh, per, it's 21.59, so and what definitely. what was it the previous year? The previous year, I'll have to look that up. So I've anyway. been telling people that it's no longer going to be, you know, Blake Griffin or Kevin Love, like the big debate. 
It's going to be Blake Griffin, Kevin Love, or DeMarcus Cousins. Uh, I'm think, with you there. I, I, I think he's right there in that conversation. By the way, imagine, you know, they, they, they had a point guard who knew really how to get him the ball. Right? Yeah. I don't know if he finished this way, but I know for a while he led the league in charges taken, too, which I thought was pretty cool for a guy with the, the, <laughs> the issues that everyone said he had. Or, and he did, obviously, but, yeah. Cousins last year, 14.62. So 14.62 to nearly 22. Pretty big jump. I, I feel even better about that. Big jump. <laughs> yeah. Coach of the year. Technically, now, not all of us have the greatest opinion of Vinny Del Negro, but he was the head coach of one of the biggest uh, win differential teams from last year to this year. Nick, do you think uh, Vinny should, should deserve some conversation about coach of the year? Some very little. Succinct. Okay, thanks. Charlie, what about you? <laughs> no, I, I think he deserves conversation just in that uh, Neil Payne wrote about this basketball prospectus. It's always the coach of the team that kind of exceeds expectations that gets that gets thrown into this conversation. I think that he deserves to be in the conversation just so we can address that as kind of the criteria for how we judge it. I, I don't think he is the coach of the year at all. I don't think he particularly deserves to have a contract next year with the Clippers, so I don't think that, that Who, he should be. Who's your coach of the year then, Charlie? Uh, I think it's something like Popovich, Thibodeau. Um, can, can we put Adelman in there? Because that, yeah. that team was largely the same, and they were playing much better before. Rudy well, and also Anzo Ty Corbin, I think, was the other, is the other one. DJ, any other candidates that you think would be acceptable? Mm, uh, there's a lot this year, um, but the way I look at it is kind of like the LeBron for MVP sort of thing. Yeah, if you're picking a coach that's not named Greg Popovich, you're going with the better story and not the guy who did the best coaching job. Does my, Thibodeau not fall into that? Opinion. No, a, a Thibodeau for turning John Lucas the third into a passable point guard for much of the season right. <laughs> deserves a ton of credit, and his defensive system is obviously incredible, but I mean, I, I got to go with Pop. The, how many people were predicting the Spurs to, again, be where they're at? And, and the way that he takes – look at that bench. Look at all the depth they have. He turned these no-name D-League guys. Danny Green's a contributor. Gary Neal's a contributor. He made all these guys into very good players. Uh, I, I give it to Pop for sure. Well, let's segue right into the next – category too then because then you could make the argument that Buford found a lot of these guys and that he should get executive of the year. Kevin, how do you feel about that? I had uh, Olshay one, Buford a very close second. Yeah. Uh, you also not just consider finding those guys, but I, I believe, I think Green, Neil, I think the number of minimum contracts in, mm -hmm. in the Spurs rotation, I'm not talking about guys sitting on the bench, uh, you know, in, in, in warmups. They, the ability to integrate, though, I, I still – the reason I'll go Olshay is, you know, it's so funny that it's just this fait complete. Chris Paul ended up here. That deal took work, and um, it was work that was put in two years ago um, when they courted LeBron, and, and, and this has been a process. Um, I'm going to have a feature story on Olshay in, in the next week or so. Um, published on ESPN.com, and it kind of explains the story. It's more than just, oh, you you, you you crafted a deal that landed one of the five best players in the NBA. Um, Buford's phenomenal, and look, if he won the award, no objection here. Um, it, it's a tough one, because who to whom do you credit the Spurs' success? Is it Buford's foresight to sign guys like castaways like Green and Neal and Bonner, who, by the way, have been floating around the league, and Dewan Blair with a second-round draft pick? Um, or is it Popovich who actually puts the pieces on the board and moves them around? And so, uh, you know, if there was a joint award, you know, the Spurs get it. And, you know, that award might be the Larry O'Brien trophy, and we'll see. <laughs> okay. Uh, I thought that uh, David Morway, Morway, or I guess Larry Bird, I don't really know which one is running that, that organization in, in Indiana, should deserve a lot of praise, but then I'm a big fan of potential. They have all that cap room that, uh, this off season, and that that team looks pretty good. Charlie, what do you think about this whole executive yeah, race? Yeah, I, I think in Indy they're in it. I also think, um, I guess if he was technically the general manager all year, uh, Glenn Grun Grunfeld in New York, um, 
I, I put Olshay number one as well, but uh, I, I think the New York thing is interesting. I thought they overpaid for Chandler, but obviously that made a huge difference. Um, I wasn't as high on Shumpert in the draft, but he's made a difference. And just uh, talk about minimum guys. They brought in a few pieces that really helped. Um, but I put O'Shea number one also. And I, I thought what was interesting about that was that I don't think, as Kevin said, I don't think this may, was even really his best year. I think the Quran signing really hasn't worked. Um, I think some of the I, I don't know if he did much else, um, and he kind of, a lot of other moves in the margins were better the, the last few years than this was, um, but he got Chris Paul, and that was it. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a difficult award. I mean, if you want to actually, if the award is, let's enumerate all the great moves of the last 12 months, or since since last year's draft that this person is executed, you know, you, you drop a list, which is why I, I you know, for all of Indiana's success this year, other than the George Hill trade and the, in, well, I guess the David West acquisition as well, you know, a lot of those pieces were in place. Um, right. What's impressed me about Olshea is that, you know, I think the Clippers have become a team that can win the 50-50 battle for the minimum salary guy. You know, the Clippers are a place now that a guy like Kenyon Martin will say, I got my pick of the litter. I'll go with the Clippers. And I just think an executive's ability to kind of rebrand a franchise as a destination, you know, and it's a process that started, I think, in 2010 with the LeBron meeting. You know, it took a lot to get that meeting. And, um, you know, th these are things that I think an executive can do beyond just, and again, I, I, like, like Charlie, I'm no fan of the Quran signing. I think, you know, the organization may come to regret it in another year or two uh, when they'll, that they could use that space on someone else. Um, look, they got Nick Young for free, basically. Uh, but so I, I'm with you. I don't know that, that there was any other just brilliant move. Um, you know, they didn't really get many picks last year. They ended up with Tompkins and um, Travis Leslie. Uh, Vinny won't play Tompkins. Right. We'll see um, what happens with that. But uh, so, so, so there's that. But it, to me, it, it – I'm, I mean, I am taking more of sort of a blue sky approach to this award. And I just think that the rebranding exercise that any general manager of the Los Angeles Clippers has to undergo um, is pretty severe. And, 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 the, and the, it just, we talk about the team differently. We just, everybody around the league talks about them. Yeah, you still get your Sterling jokes and you still get, ah, it's the Clippers or whatever. Um, but uh, just, it's, in, it's incredible just, around the league just how the franchise is perceived right now a place where oh they're gonna go out and get a big name coach now like really i mean that never was the case yeah before we move on i i guess my point is that why all shea should win is because there were a lot of singles that neil O'Shea could have hit there there were a lot of little trades that he could have made or you know maybe move came in for an iggy dollar or something along those lines um, not franchise altering moves, but he waited for his pitch and hit the home run. He acquired assets and got Chris Paul. <laughs> I mean, it, that took a lot of patience to do on a whim that Chris Paul would want to play here. It took a lot of guts, a lot of patience. So I think it's almost like a uh, a career achievement award, even even if the Quran signing wasn't great. I think you still give it to Olshay. Great. And on, on the topic of Chris Paul, Nick, uh, does Chris Paul have any chance at MVP or is he just going to be the, the gracious runner-up, hold that hold that plate or whatever they give runner-ups? <laughs> uh, I, I, again, I'm missing the first part of the question. So this is what, CP3 not going to be MVP, I take it? Basically. Yeah. yeah. Uh, probably... Even I think Kevin Durant's, you know, his team has been uh, more successful than the Clippers. Is he more important than Chris Paul? I don't think so. But yeah, we're de we're definitely looking at a third place type of finish for Chris Paul in terms of uh, MVP. Yeah, I, I I I think we're actually kind of headed down a battle between Durant and and Paul in terms of the narrative and how we how we come down to this. I as Kevin said before this uh, tonight kind of showed. Uh, just if we needed any more reason to see Paul's uh, value to the, the Clippers, it was kind of like the Peyton Manning for MVP uh, chant. That was uh, it's it's obvious when they're gone. 
Um, as I said, I was talk when I was talking to Jordan about him writing his Chris Paul for MVP um, piece. I, I don't. I'm not usually a fan of just the narrative and saying he changed the culture, but when the numbers are so darn close, I mean, he was as we said second in most of the metrics to LeBron. Um, I do think he vaults into the conversation at least uh, if it's not going to be LeBron in a landslide. I think that if the Clippers didn't stumble down the stretch here and they would have actually caught the Lakers for the three seed and get the, the Pacific Division title, everyone would kind of be talking about Paul. Would have been peaking at the right time with the, the last you know statistical games that he had. Maybe then he could steal some votes from LeBron just because the Heat you know have stumbled you know down the stretch on their end. So I, I don't think Paul is the MVP this year. I think it's LeBron, obviously, but uh, Paul definitely deserves a lot of those second place votes. I think he's second on my ballot next to uh, Durant. I should get a ballot. How do you get one of those? <laughs> Kevin, your thoughts on this? There's a case we made for Paul. I, I think Jordan Heimer made it eloquently on ESPN LA. Uh, he'd be my second choice. You know, right there with Durant, and uh, there's there. It's a, it's a noble thing to be the second or third most valuable person in the league. Um, you're just talking about a person in LeBron James who's having one of the ten or fifteen best individual seasons in NBA history, and so everybody loves a good debate. Uh, I'm sort of with DJ on this. Uh, I'll love the Popovich argument. Uh, there's just no debate. Uh, not to be dogmatic about it, but. I don't know that any legitimate case can be made for anybody other than LeBron James. Do we know what Chris, what's Chris Paul's best finish in MVP? Has he been he's been top five, right? I think he was second to uh, Kobe in two thousand eight. I think. Huh. And there was an argument that Chris Paul should have won that year, but it was that makeup lifetime award for Kobe for not having won several years back. Yeah, one of those years he was for sure top three. He was either second or third. I think it was that year. Right. Okay. Uh, wrapping up the regular season. Uh, final thoughts on the Clippers in the regular season before they head off for their playoff matchup with Memphis, either at home or away. Nick, lead us off. Uh, I'm worried about the defense for the Clippers, but not as much as I'm. I'm now kind of worried about. Uh, adjustments we see over the course of a series and how the uh, the offense is going to uh, to deal with Memphis as they uh, they go through those. Yeah, I think it was a crazy season just looking at it from overall. Um, you know, I, a lot of people left them for dead in the middle of the year there, including me, when they had that <laughs> uh, three-game road losing trip. I thought Vinny was gone. I thought the wheels were falling off and the Clippers were going to be, you know, if they were lucky, a 7-8 seed first-round exit for sure. They bounced back. Um, they showed a lot of resiliency. Just a, it's, it's a weird time to be a Clipper fan. A lot of, I know, at least for me, mixed emotions on this team. I, they haven't been as endearing as past squads. Maybe I'm addicted to losing. I don't know. It's, it's, been, a, it's been a fun year to be a Clipper fan and kind of learn a little bit about yourself, I think. Yeah, I, DJ, I agree with that. I know we've talked about it. Um, and I've been kind of conflicted about the team ever since the trade just because I, I felt like there was something building organically and then it kind of jumped up and, and fast-forwarded into this new Clipper situation that it was. And, it, I, you know, I think we kind of thought that they'd be a playoff team as we talked about it in this kind of situation. But the way it went... Um, wasn't really how I expected. I think just in terms of a personality, they took on a much more um, unlikable uh, personality than than I expected. I, you know, a lot of people th thought this would be the most watchable team in the league. Um, you know, Lob City and all this, and it, they just uh, that wasn't their their way of playing um, and their way of acting. Frankly, um, as I've said, and I think we've all agreed, that might help them going to the playoffs. They're nasty. Um, they're going to get people in foul trouble. They're going to get under people's skin. And uh, it, it's it's going to be fun, I think, after the season to look back and kind of break down the, the, the roller coaster that it was. But uh, going into the playoffs, the one thing I would say just recently is that um, I thought they got better defensively for a while. And uh, I don't know over the last few games if, if maybe that wasn't the case or 
or that wasn't sustainable because I just I, the, the rotations had just been in these games they've had to win just one game to to get home court. Um, it just it hasn't it hasn't looked good on that end. Uh, what do you think, Evan? I, we'll have a lot of time to talk about the various matchups, what they're capable of defensively, uh, how they'll be able to move the ball, and how they'll be able to score. But I think the story of the season is that this is a franchise that has achieved a level of relevance in the league that we've never seen before uh, from this franchise. And you see it in the press rooms, uh, on the road and at home. You see it when you look at road attendance. Clippers are basically one of their their four teams that are sort of head and shoulders above the rest and drawing on the road you know and they're right there with the lakers the knicks and the heat you know this is a it's it would have been unheard of and a lot of it speaks to the anxiety that charlie you and dj have expressed that you know something was a little lost there's something a little mercenary about this group you know it wasn't it's it's not a they didn't come up through the farm system they kind of went out and just got players uh, and, and for whatever reason, you know, it may not be more as satisfying to be a fan of a team like that. But the bottom line is, is this organization uh, and this team, and for better and for worse, yeah, they, to many fans, they're obnoxious. I mean, it, it might be the case that for the next four or five years, you know, especially if the Heat win their championship, that the Clippers become, you know, a team that annoys the hell out of most kind of hardcore but neutral NBA fans and uh, that might be something the Clippers have to live with is being just kind of you know in in the context of pro wrestling and it's a metaphor Beckley Mason used I mean they may be the heel uh, you know against an endearing Oklahoma City Thunder team or, or whoever else emerges uh, but I think that's the story of this season and the other thing I would say is they haven't been fun to watch and they haven't looked good at times and they play 600 ball right okay yeah. so uh, I, I think the other thing to think about is just as they move forward. Now, there are two things to look at here. I mean, one is is they're going to lose a lot of these pieces in the off season. Uh, you know, Randy might be playing himself into a pretty decent mid level. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if you know some team out there needing a you know a, a shooting guard, you know, throws a you know five and a half million dollar, and I don't know that the Clippers would match that uh, or, or would, would would give him that sort of opportunity. Uh, you know, Chauncey probably isn't coming back. I mean. Kenyon's on a one-year deal. A good number of their rotation guys aren't there. But what we've seen is, is that I think we all agree that this team doesn't look all that great all that often. And yet you look at the standings in fourth, fifth, third, whatever. <laughs> they're one of the, I mean, by not looking all that good and not playing all that well all that often, they're one of the eight best teams in basketball. Now yeah. imagine a scenario where the choreography between Paul and Griffin becomes more fluid, where DeAndre, you know, becomes Tyson Chandler, which is which is the projection there, uh, where Eric Bledsoe becomes this sort of change of pace quarterback that they bring in, you know, and and you know he becomes Goran uh, Dragic. Dragic. It's a, you know, I mean, it, it's there there are all sorts of possibilities. Um, they're going to have to go out and acquire some talent in the off season. We'll have plenty of all summer to talk about that. But I think, you know, when we we just take a look back and we look down from thirty thousand feet. This has been the most radical change for almost any organization in any pro sport in any year. I don't think I'm being hyperbolic when you consider the Clippers' history and what we're sitting here talking about tonight. Yeah, one quick. I just DJ, you wrote you wrote after the first game. I remember after Golden State, um, they didn't play very well and they won, and that's kind of how the season's gone. I think. Yeah, I I think so too. I think I I think I said uh, the Clippers didn't play better; they just were better, and that's right. kind of how the season was. It's a weird it's a weird feeling to to root for that to to not root for the underdog anymore. But given the alternative, of course, you take like Kevin said, one of the top eight teams in the league playing six hundred ball. So okay, guys, thanks for your help. Uh, all our viewers, thanks for tuning in. Uh, bookending the regular season of the 2012 Los Angeles Clippers, we have postseason coming up, so we'll be here for all of that. Uh, stay tuned for our playoff preview and maybe a couple of other surprises down the road. So for Charlie Widows, DJ Foster, Kevin Arnovitz, and Nick Flint, I'm Andrew Hong. Thanks for tuning in.